Welcome and thank you for joining today's conference, Sampling for FAO Investigation. Before we begin, please ensure that you've opened up the chat panel by using the associated icons located at the bottom of your screen. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. To submit a written question, please select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, enter your question in the message box provided, and send. Please note that all connections are muted at this time. With that, I'll turn the call over to Liz Fernandez. Liz, please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. And I'd also like to welcome you to uh, what will be its first and hopefully many webinars on topics important for our colleagues working in the field. Um, our speaker today is Dr. Greg Mayer. Dr. Mayer is a microbiologist with the Diagnostic Services Section. He's um, the Diagnostic Services Section Senior Diagnostic Advisor at the Plum Island Animal Disease Center. Greg is responsible for supervisors and participating in the everyday functions of the APHIS Diagnostic Services Section and overseeing coordination of its staff efforts. Dr. Mayer earned his PhD in molecular biology at the State University of New York at Stony Brook. And prior to joining APHIS, Dr. Mayer held the position of Associate Scientist and Research Associate Microbiologist with the Agricultural Research Service at PIATIC. And with that, I'm gonna turn the webinar over to Dr. Mayer. Good morning, and I, I thank you all for joining me this morning. We're going to talk about foreign animal disease diagnostication investigations, and sampling in particular we're going to dwell a lot on. Um, as Liz said, I'm the Senior Diagnostic Advisor for the Diagnostic Services section at FATL, and with that I'm just going to get right into the talk. So the areas that we're going to cover this morning include what does a foreign animal disease investigation involve? What are the things you should be thinking about if you're heading out to do an investigation? You just have the phone call from the AVIC or the state vet and they'd like you to go out someplace, either to a farm or a slaughter plant or a stockyard and do an investigation because there are sick animals there. In particular, we're gonna talk a lot about FMD samples. Vesicular cases represent the huge chunk of cases that we get at FATL. Uh, that's because we're trying to make sure that foot and mouth disease does not make its way back into the United States. So we'll talk a lot about samples and the tests that we use those samples for, for foot and mouth disease diagnostics. We'll also talk about ASF and CSF and the types of samples that are better for those diseases and the diagnostic tests that we have at FATL that we can use to test for those. And I'll dwell a little bit on what to send and what not to send. So the function of diagnostic is at FATL is to make sure that we're making sure that foreign animal diseases are not making their way into the United States. So if something looks like it might be a foreign animal disease, we wanna make sure that that's not what it is that it's a domestic look-alike disease in those animals. We also have the responsibility to make sure that zoo animals, for example, are free of diseases when they make their way into this country. So we have a, a long-standing operational uh, responsibility to test those animals as they make their way into the United States to be sure that they're free of foreign animal diseases. We're very involved in disease surveillance. Uh, our most active program is the classical swine fever serology program that we have, but we are now helping to set up the first uh, African swine fever surveillance as well. We also perform safety testing. There are companies that want to send kits to the United States, but sometimes those are produced using animal products from countries that have foreign animal diseases. So we have to make sure that the ingredients in those kits are free of disease and are safe to be used in the United States. And safety treatment. Um, we used to have a, a much broader relationship with universities and uh, people who wanted to have materials brought into the United States for studies. At the time, we were allowed to use gamma irradiation. There are some concerns that that may not be completely um, removing infectivity from all sample types. So there's studies going on right now to look at whether or not we can go back to using gamma irradiation in the future. So for diagnostics, which is the process of identifying and determining what's causing a disease, there are a lot of parts to that process. Um, things that 
from your perspective as the field investigators, the field veterinarian who's on the farm, case history is a really important thing. You need to know, have these animals been sick for a prolonged period of time? Is this something sudden? What are the numbers of animals that are sick? How many of those animals um, are, are morbid and can't get up, can't move around, aren't interested in eating? Have there been high mortality rates recently? What are the clinical signs? Depending upon what the clinical signs are, it's going to help you pick which diseases you want to rule out. And a lot of times that's looking for gross lesions. Are there things that are happening in those animals like um, tissue sloughing off the tongue or vesicular lesions on the coronary bands or um, hemorrhaging in the extremities that's causing purple discoloration? Those are the sorts of things that you're looking for and, and putting that all together as part of that case history. Um, one of the things I don't mention here is movement. A lot of times, one of the things that we have for high priority cases is we ask, has there been movement on or off the farm or on and off the facility or in and out of the, the, the uh, stockyard? And when is the next shipment of animals likely to happen? Because that helps the state vet and the AVIC decide what the priority for that type of case is. Laboratory tests. I'll talk to you a little bit about the types of tests we have at Saddle and some of the tests that have uh, been sent out to the Nolan laboratories. The Nolan labs are an extension of the reference laboratories. They are a, a real partnership with what we do in Ames and in, in Faddle and what we'll be doing in MBAF. And they're incredibly useful and incredibly helpful. And if you have the opportunity to um, work with your Nolan lab to get diagnostics, you'll find that they really are a wonderful um, addition to this part of the, the service. But we'll talk about antibody detection and antigen detection as well as histopathology and when those different tests are most useful. We get asked a lot of questions about field tests. And um, one of the responsibilities FATAL has had over the last couple of years is working with DHS to evaluate some of the pen sides and bioportable assays that are out there. We um, partner with them because they get requests for, hey, can somebody look at our assay and tell us whether or not it actually works? And we have all the sample types that will allow us to test those assays. So um, when things are not under the COVID restraints that they are right now, we have the ability to involve ourselves in some of those evaluations of field tests. And we have a validation uh, group that is responsible for doing a lot of that. And we'll talk a lot of today about specimens, and that's going to be the real high point of our, our talk. So let me continue now. So sample criteria, what samples to send? Well, a lot of that is disease dependent, right? If you are looking for vesicular disease samples, those are going to be different from an ASF, CSF sample or a rabbit hemorrhagic disease sample. So whatever the disease is, there are specific sample types that have been recognized as high value, low effort um, samples to take. And those are really important because that helps you in most investigations decide which are the samples I, I want to be sure I get and which are the ones that I can say, okay, it would be nice if I could get that, but it really isn't essential for making this rule out. There are different criteria for um, different diseases also because of the, the type of disease and the virulence. Sometimes things like classical swine fever can be very low virulent, and it's more difficult to find those in animals because the animals will look perfectly healthy, and you have to use a different sample type and a different test to look for those. Um, fit for purpose. Surveillance is a different thing than actually doing an investigation. So surveillance is basically modeled on the fact that there are no lesions to swab. You're going to have to come up with a sample type that could tell you whether or not a virus was there on a perfectly healthy animal. So it's a different sample type for surveillance than it would be for a fat investigation. Um, importation, exportation. There are very specific rules about what tests have to be used when you're doing an import-export uh, sampling. And that's not necessarily um, the most current, uh, up-to-date, uh, amazingly technologically wonderful test out there. Often it, it's a, a serology test that um, has been used for the last 60 years. 
but those are regulated by the rules around importation and exportation of those animals. So we have to use the sample types and the tests that are recommended for importation and exportation. Outbreak situations. Well, during an outbreak, the samples I'm going to want for the first priority one case for an outbreak are going to be different from the ones that you're going to want a month into the outbreak, and they're going to be different from the ones that you want towards the end of the outbreak when you're trying to show that you are now free from disease. And those sample types vary through that outbreak response. The amount of sample is very important. How much sample do you need? We're an ISO-accredited laboratory. FATAL and, and NVSL Ames are both ISO-accredited laboratories. Our tests require that we have a way to show that the assay answer that we get actually can be confirmed by another test. So you, when you send us a sample, there has to be enough sample not only to run that first ELISA test, which probably uses very little sample, or first PCR test, which uses very little sample, but there also has to be enough so that we can do the confirmatory test, which may use considerably more sample if they need to be run in case we get a cross-reactive answer on that first test. So there has to be enough sample to begin with or we can't proceed with testing. And sample integrity is important. There are, um, you know, ice packs are, are the essential. You have to make sure that you're keeping things cold. Um, sometimes things can be frozen, but freezing things often can affect its performance in certain assays. So you want to be careful and, and contact us when you're trying to decide if things should be shipped on ice or frozen. Um, formal and fixing of the tissue is very important for our pathologists, and transport media differ. So we recommend that uh, you contact the NVSL shipping department in Ames, and they'll be able to supply you with the BHI or the TBTB medias that are most commonly used for foreign animal disease investigations. So then you're left with the question, okay, now I've got all of my sample stuff and I'm all set to go out and do this, but what animals should I sample? So right off the bat, animals showing clinical signs are going to be the ones that are going to let us have a, 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 the best chance of seeing what viruses are present in that herd. So sometimes blood is a good sample. Whole blood can be used. Um, the heparin blood can be used for virus isolation. The EDTA blood can be used for PCR. And serum can be used for doing serology testing. But that depends on the disease. Foot and mouth is only viremic for about a day. So your chance of actually finding foot and mouth in a blood sample in the EDTA or the heparin blood is very low. And yes, you can see antibodies, but not till about four days after the infection. So by the time, if you get there and the animal is in full flow clinical presentation, it probably doesn't have antibodies yet. Classical swine fever um, is an immunosuppressive disease. So in those cases, animals that are clinically ill aren't going to have antibodies for another two weeks. So it, your timing for all of this differs. Swabs are a great sample. Uh, throughout this talk, I'm going to tell you that no sample is worth your health or your life. You are APHIS's most important resource. And I truly appreciate the job that you all do on a daily basis. Swabs are an incredibly easy sample. Even an animal in distress shows very little, little resistance to you taking um, a polypropylene swab of the lesion and putting that into a tube. It's not as um, strenuous or energetic as, as having to take a blood sample. It's a really easy sample type, and it has a very high value because if those open sores have virus, you know, if it, if it was foot and mouth, there would be a tremendous viral load in those samples. So it's a really high value sample at very little effort. Um, and if you have a dead animal or if you've had to euthanize an animal because it was suffering, you want to make sure that you collect tissues, but the tissue types differ from disease to disease. So you have to use your charts that you have in your, in your fad prep manual to determine what the best samples are. And you can always call FADL. If you call us up, we'd be happy to have a conversation with you. We'd be happy to talk through all of the domestic diseases that might be in your area of the country right now. If you were to call me right now, 
from one of the states in the southwest, I would tell you that VSD is very prevalent right now. So if you have a cow with vesicular lesion, we want to make sure that we have the right samples to do the foot and mouth and the VSD testing. Um, recovered animals, is there any value in taking samples from a recovered animal? Well, there is. You know, that, that serum to look for antibodies is that's a, a, something that when we get towards an outbreak response is going to be a very important sample, especially towards the end of the outbreak when you're wanting to show that the antibody prevalence is dropping and that the number of animals who have been in contact with the disease is dropping. That's going to be a really important sample. But for a case where you have active lesions, recovered animals are not as, as great a sample type because the PCR off the lesion is going to tell me for sure what virus is there. ELISA kits, for the most part, are, are wonderful things. They do a really good job, but there are always cross-reactive events that happen with ELISA kits. So um, as an example, we used to have a, a swine vesicular disease ELISA kit that we used up until about 2012 when we realized that animals that had um, antibodies against Seneca Valley virus actually came up cross-reactive, borderline positive on those swine vesicular disease ELISA kit tests, so we couldn't use them anymore. And that's because those ELISA kits are made in a different country where they don't have SVV or SVA, and those animals, that the animal population that they did all the QC for their kit on had never been exposed to that. So it's important for us to understand the limitations of our test and then give you advice. And for most of the time, if you have animals that have lesions or animals that have clinical signs, those are the ones to test. The recovered animals can be done as a follow-up if necessary. And dead animals, again, fresh and formal and fixed tissues are very important, but it depends what disease you're talking about, which samples you want to take. So sample types, blood. Again, there's a, a red top two, which is the serum for serology, lets us look for antibodies. The, the green top two, heparin, can be used for virus isolation. Um, EDTA blood can be used for PCR, but again, it depends on the disease. So the heparin blood and the EDTA blood are really good samples to look for virus by PCR and for, by virus isolation for CSF and ASF, but again, they're not really great samples if you have a, uh, an animal with vesicular lesions. Swabs. It's very important to use Dacron. Cotton swabs used to be way more um, obtainable than they are now. Most people have switched over to Dacron, so that's what the suppliers are using. But you want to make sure that the swabs you're using are some sort of polyester, that they're not cotton. Cotton holds on to material. It also holds on to virus. So if you swab a lesion and you had a million particles of virus, the cotton swab's going to hold on to several hundred thousand of those. So that's why you want to make sure you're using the Dacron or the polyester swab. It lets go of those virus particles into the media so it can be tested by PCR and virus isolation. You can get BHI and TBTV tubes from the Ames uh, group, the APHIS Ames group, and those are pre-measured to two to three mil uh, swab aliquots. Uh, they also, the BHI comes in a, a larger volume, I think it's five mils or seven mils for using uh, pooled samples for uh, avian influenza samples. Tissue, uh, fresh tissue, a quarter size piece is more than enough. Smaller than that would be fine too, except it limits what we can do with the sample. We recommend about a, a gram or two of tissue. That would be something about the size of a quarter. Um, tissue can be sent to us either in world pack bags or covered in media. Again, you can use a little bit of BHI or TBTB to cover the tissue sample, and that just helps stabilize any virus that might be present in that sample. Uh, formalin-6 tissue should be sent in that buffered formalin. And a probang sample, which is going to be an important thing if we ever have an outbreak of foot and mouth in the United States, um, it, you do you mix that in TBTB 50-50. It just it buffers the a acid in the um, probang sample. It allows the, any virus that might be present in it to be stabilized, and it gets us to us so that we can do virus isolation as well as PCR. 
Now your fab kits come with a whole bunch of stuff in it that makes your job a little bit easier, swabs and broth and um, well pack bags and the TVTB and BHI. You want to go through on a regular basis and make sure that, one, you have enough material in your fab kit, and two, that it hasn't expired. As an ISO accredited lab, if I get a, a TVTB tube that's got an expiration date on it that was last year, if that was the only thing you have, I'm going to tell you over the phone that, yes, go ahead and use it. Make sure that the color still looks correct, and then go ahead and use it. But I still have to record on my report that I send out that the swab was sent to us in expired media. So just keep a, a, a track of what you have and when it expires. And if you're getting close to the expiration date, contact Ames and tell them that you need more media. Now, FADL has the capability to test for all the underlying diseases seen here on the OIE list of diseases. And they may not be tests that we run, you know, frequently. Um, I cannot tell you the last time we, we did an, a Rift Valley Fever PCR test. It, it was probably 10 years ago. But the fact that we have the ability to do these tests shows you just how seriously we take helping you figure out what's going on with your animals. This list does not include all of the domestic diseases we also have tests for. And what we try to do is when we get a case, we're going to show you that it's not a foot and mouth disease animal, but that it probably has something like bovine papular stomatitis, or it has something like EHD, or it has something like Seneca uh, A virus. Those are the types of tests that we run on the virus isolates to show you that, yep, there was, we could isolate and have um, confidence that there was a domestic disease present in those animals. So how many cases did you get a year? Well, back in 2014 and for most of the years prior to that, we ran close to 200 cases a year. And that may not sound like a lot. I know the Nolan Labs handle a tremendous number of cases. But 180 cases was still a significant number of samples because in a fat investigation, you tend to get a series of animals who are sampled, we usually recommend three to five animals. We're usually getting uh, not only swabs, but in many cases, serum from those animals. We're doing the virus isolations, the PCRs, the ELISAs. So it, it runs into a, a significant number of tests all on its own, even though there were only 200 cases. But in 2015, that started to increase rapidly. Um, 2015, we saw, you know, like a 60% increase in the number of cases. And by the time we got to 2016, it had more than doubled our caseload per year. And then by 2017, it had jumped up to over 1,300 cases that we were getting, which is where we sat for 2018. 2019, we're back down to about 855 cases, but that's not because the caseload has changed. It's because we found a partner to help us with all those accessions, and that partners the Nolan Laboratory Network. So as you can see from 2014, the diseases that we were testing back then were things like parapox and EHD. Those were the things that we were finding in a large percentage of those cases were these domestic diseases, VSV. And when we got to 2015, again, we still had VSV, but now this Seneca Valley virus or Seneca virus A started to increase in the population of pigs, domestic pigs, and we were seeing vesicular lesions on a more regular basis. By the time we got to 2016, that percentage had increased dramatically, and most of the other diseases were being squeezed into one tiny little part of the, of the pie. 2017, almost all of the domestic cases that we managed to diagnose were Seneca Valley A virus or Seneca virus A. And the same was true for 2018 and for 2019. So most of the casework that we get is coming up positive for Seneca virus A. Now, that doesn't mean that that's all we get, because like you can see, we're still getting a small number of positives from other things. I can tell you I have not done the chart yet for 2020, but a large chunk of the 2020 pie is going to be rabbit hemorrhagic disease. We get um, hundreds of cases a month, 
for the, that disease. So that's going to be a large chunk of next year's pie is going to be rabbit hemorrhagic disease. So tests. Well, like I was telling you a minute ago, that 1,300 tests that we ran in, in 2017, or 1,300 cases that we got in 2017, we actually ran 14,000 tests. The reason that there was any kind of a break in 2017 is we came up with testing algorithms that allowed us to use fewer tests to show what we really wanted to know. In 2016, when we had 450 cases, we were running 11,000 tests, and a large part of that was virus isolation on every vesicular sample that came through the door. By the time we got to 2017, we had states that agreed that if we could show that it was FMD negative and swine vesicular A virus positive on a PCR, it could be done there and we didn't have to do the virus isolation. Otherwise, the numbers of tests would have gone up just as fast as the number of cases. When we got to 2018 and 2019, we started to get a little relief, and that's because some of those cases are being tested in the Nolan labs for um, slaughter plants that are, are repeat customers, where you have shipments constantly going to the same slaughter plants of animals that have vesicular lesions in pigs. Those Nolan labs are getting those samples, and they're testing for Seneca virus A, and foot and mouth, and if it comes up foot and mouth negative, Seneca virus A positive, the testing is done on those samples. FATAL is still testing about 5% of all those samples for QA purposes to show that the non lab and FATAL do not get different answers. And we're testing a lot of the on-farm cases to make sure that those are really the Seneca and, and those get the full um, virus isolation as well as all the PCRs. So in 2018, 343 of the cases that we were getting were actually tested only at the Nolan lab. And in 2019, 687 of those cases were tested only at the Nolan labs. So they've been a, a wonderful partner in this and they've been truly helpful. And my staff cannot thank them enough for the job that they've been doing to help us deal with this disease. So we're going to move towards vesicular FAD investigations, whether it's a cow or a pig. It really doesn't matter. If it's got lesions on the coronary bands or in the mouth, you want to be thinking about it from the perspective of this could be foot and mouth. So when we do FAD schools, we use a lot of scenarios. We give people a, a problem to think about and then ask them to think about it, what they would do and how they would do it. So the scenario here is you receive a call telling you that there's an investigation on a cattle farm. A 16 to 18-month-old bull was found recumbent in the pasture and died soon after the local vet arrived. They noticed large unruptured vesicles on the tongue, so they called you. So he also noticed at the time that there were two other bulls drooling with peeled skin on the nose and slight limping. So when you get there, you should be thinking about, okay, this sounds like a vesicular case. The animals are lame. The animals are drooling, they have sores in their mouth. Those are the types of areas that you want to be looking at for sampling. Hopefully when you get there, it does not look like this. That's a ruptured vesicle on the tongue. You can see how the epithelium is pulled away. That's an unruptured vesicle. If you were to um, restrain the animal and, and try to siphon liquid out of that with a needle, you would be able to get a considerable amount of liquid. And these are lesions along the coronary bands and between the hooves. So what kinds of samples should you be thinking about? Well, in the current SAD prep manual, you'll see a chart that looks like this. It tells you a foot and mouth disease and then specimens and then what types of media should the specimens be in. And pretty much any sample you can think of is on this chart. Well, we realized a long time ago that if you send an FADD out to a farm to do an investigation and you tell them, oh, hey, it's late Friday afternoon and we need these samples to faddle as quickly as possible, so do it quickly. Oh, and I, oh, by the way, we're sending it FedEx, so you've got to get it to the FedEx facility before they close at 6. 
Now you have to start making choices because you have to get the best samples you can in the time that you can get them. So when we look at this chart, it really wasn't helpful in helping you look at the value of the sample versus the amount of time it would take you to get it versus whether or not you had assistance taking those samples. Um, I would recommend that if you are thinking about taking vesicular fluid, if that animal is not in a, in a pen, if it's not um, in a chute, if it's not held up against a wall by someone else, if there is not someone else helping you restrain that animal, taking vesicular fluid out of a lesion is a very difficult thing, and it is something that could cause you injury if you're not having help. So is that a great sample? Absolutely. Vesicular fluid is the best sample you could have to tell me whether or not foot and mouth is there. Is it the easiest sample to get? No, not really. Your chances of getting head butted or kicked or bitten are pretty high. So what are your options here? Well, again, if you have help and can restrain the animal, that's a sample you might consider. But if it's got tissue hanging off its tongue and a huge lesion and lesions on its feet, then a swab becomes a really easy sample to get that has exceptionally high value. So what we're going to try and do is, as we redo the fat prep manual, we're going to try and characterize that ease of use for the sampling procedure. So with live animals, we're going to prioritize which are the ones that are easiest and highest value at the top of the list, and then a little bit more difficult as you go down the list. So when you, you'll see in all of these charts with the live animals, the serum is a sample. Yes, it's a good sample, but it is harder to get. It's harder to restrain the animal. If you don't have help, it might be a dangerous thing for you to be doing alone, depending on the size of the animal or the aggressiveness of the animal or whether the animal is isolated or in a group. So blood samples tend to be lower on this list because they require assistance, whereas the swab sample, which is going to let us do the PCR and rule out the presence of the virus, is a much easier sample to get. On deceased animals, we listed the tissues that are best suited for these diseases. So as you go from disease to disease, that's how they're going to look. So brain, heart, and fusion media and TBTB are very similar medias. The real difference is TBTB contains a, a pH indicator. Under normal circumstances, it should have this sort of pink coloration, this pink-red coloration. If it has that color, that's still functioning, and the pH is okay. However, BHI doesn't have that indicator, and it's that bright yellow. If you send us a sample, and I think you sent it to me in TBTB, and it looks like BHI, that would mean that the pH of that sample is somewhere around 14. As you get above a pH of 12, the, the TBTB turns bright yellow. If it was day glow pink, that would be a pH of 3. So you have to tell me for sure what media it's in so I know whether or not the color is actually telling me something. If you send me TV, TV and it's really acidic or really a basic, the color is going to let me know that. And again, here are the three types of blood samples. I want to use this graphic. There's a lot of tissue here in tubes, various tubes, various sizes. Uh, some people will put tubes and swabs in empty uh, red top tubes. That's fine. If you have a container that's handy and you put the tissue in it, that works. The amount of media you put on it should be enough to, to keep the tissue covered. If you're covering it with media, you don't need to. You can send the tissue not in media. That's fine, too. If you send me parts of the animal's body, this is a pig hoof. Um, the problem with this pig hoof is not that they sent me a whole hoof. That's fine. If it has lesions on it, I can work with that. The problem with this foot is that there were three out of four hooves on that particular pig that had lesions. Guess which one saddle got? If you're going to send me samples, be sure you're sending me samples from the lesion part of the animal. This tube is an example of dilution to extinction. There is a tiny fleck of tissue in the bottom of this tube in about 15 mils of media. 
any virus that might have been present in that tissue flex have been diluted out to the point where you probably couldn't even detect them with a PCR, not even the FMD PCR, which can detect, you know, down to a handful of particles. When you dilute, you over dilute, it makes the sample worthless. So try, if you're covering tissue, make sure that you're only using enough media to cover the tissue. So let's say that you've gone out to the farm, you've taken the samples, and they're perfect samples, and they're the ones that we've agreed you should be sending to us. What are we going to do with them? Well, the tissues, the vesicular fluid, the probang, and the swabs are all great samples to use for virus isolation and PCR. Vesicular virus isolation takes about six days. It's two three-day passages. So for me to tell you that something is truly negative, it's going to take me six days because that's how long the virus isolation goes. The real-time PCR for foot and mouth takes about two hours. So in two hours, I can tell you with almost certainty that there's no foot and mouth there. You will find that as people have become more comfortable with the PCRs, as we've evolved our technologies, more and more state veterinarians and AVICs are releasing quarantines and allowing movement of product based only on that PCR that tells them, no, we couldn't detect any foot and mouth here, or no, we couldn't detect any CSF or ASF. And in large part, that's to the huge effort that went into validating those tests and making us confident that we can detect so little virus with such amazing um, repeatability. Antigen ELISA is a great test for foot and mouth. If we ever had an outbreak, having enough tissue off that initial animal to do an antigen ELISA would be a godsend because that allows us to, to tell you what serotype. The PCR will tell you, yes, there's a foot and mouth. Most PCRs don't tell you what serotype it is. The antigen ELISA is a test that lets us get a, a look at what serotype is present. Serology. So we get a serum sample. What do we do? We have a, a 3-ABC ELISA. It's an overnight test. It's very, very sensitive as an overnight test. It can be run at a, at a shorter time frame, but the sensitivity drops off. Uh, we are now evaluating uh, another company's ELISA kit, which can be all done in about three hours. So we're looking at that and making sure through a methods comparison that they behave equivalently, and when that's finished, we'll be able to use that test as well. We have an overnight VIA. It's an agarose diffusion test. It's very old technology, but it still gives you a good indication of whether or not there are antibodies there against foot and mouth. And the tissue culture virus neutralization test takes three days, but that would tell us the antibodies were against what serotype, maybe even what um, Uh, isolate they were against. So I want to break between that scenario and the next scenario briefly and talk about the 10-4 form. A lot of the information that you used to put on the 10-4 form, you're now recording with your EMRS to go, and then you could print out a 10-4. We still find it useful for you to make sure that not only are you indicated so that you get a report at the end of this process, but that the owner and the animal location are both put down there so that we can say, okay, this is all contained in this state, or okay, you're from Iowa, but you've looked at a case in Ohio. So we want to make sure that everybody who needs to be informed is informed about where this animal is and what this animal has. It's a really good idea to take a quick moment and tell us how many animals in the herd are sick. That way we can get appreciation for, is this something widespread? Foreign animal diseases will actually infect very quickly the entire group of naive animals. Um, even things like African swine fever, which are contact, they're, they're animal to animal transfer. Those can still spread rapidly through a, a pen. So if you have only one animal sick in the pen, it probably isn't a foreign animal disease, it's probably a domestic disease. There are some um, caveats to that, which we can discuss anytime you want to give me a call. 
Referral numbers, we have to make sure that your ADIC and your state that know that you've contacted us. Uh, so that referral number lets us know that they've talked and you've talked to them. You want to make sure that you tell us what species we're looking at because that can change our testing algorithm. We have testing algorithms that are specific to cattle, to uh, sheep and goats, and to pigs. So you have to let us know what the species is so we're sure that we're using all the appropriate testing. A unique animal identifier, God forbid we need to do a trace back on this animal. If I have nothing unique about that animal, if it just says Holstein, then I'm sort of stuck because there may be 626 other Holsteins on that farm. And if I don't know which one was sick, I can't trace back where it came from. A little paragraph telling me what you saw is wonderful. That gives us a real good feeling about what it is that we should be looking for and what are some of the domestics we want to take a look at as well. Depending on the conditions of the animal that you write down in that paragraph, it helps us help you determine what this animal is truly sick with. I want to tell you that a picture says a thousand words. So if you send us a picture of what the animal has, that's very helpful too. Now you can't put that on the 10-4 form, but you can put that in the email that you send to us. I just want to point out this one. Uh, the animal that was listed on the previous 10-4 form is the exact same animal that was sampled again a few days later by a different field vet. And the problem is that the two sets of information are not matched up enough for us to understand that this was the same animal. So these two cases were handled completely separately as if they were two completely separate animals because the information on the forms didn't match. So Try and be consistent. Make sure that the information that you're getting from the farmer is the same information, you know, he gave to somebody who was there last week. You want to make sure that everything is consistent. So our second scenario that we want to go through today is a pig investigation. And you're asked to go to a swine facility where a thousand feeder pigs were recently uh, imported with the following history. Shortly after arriving at the facility, the swine experienced high fever and neurological signs. Daily mortality is in the range of 100 to 150 pigs a day for several days. Total mortality was reached about 70% at this point. Now, this sounds completely fictitious, but it was based off a case that we got, and it leads me to something that I always say. If the farmer or the facility are seeing an increase in die-offs to this extent, 100 to 150 pigs a day, why are they waiting three days to call up the state vet and say, hey, I have a problem? You should be communicating with your customers on a regular basis to make them feel more comfortable. Some of this is, is a fear of what's going to happen if they call. So if you're better friends with them, they're going to call you closer to the actual first day when they figure out that something is going on with their animals. And that's going to give us a better start at this whole process. Uh, we have tests that can detect disease at very early stages in animals. But if we don't find out until 70% of them are dead, we've really missed the, uh, the start of that disease. So hopefully when you get to the facility, you don't see animals that look like this. Pigs that aren't up and curious and moving but are, are piling up because they have a fever and they're not um, looking like they want to move and they're reluctant to even get up and acknowledge your presence, those are not normal pigs. Those are sick. If they've got discoloration in their ears and on their extremities, those are not normal pigs. This um, petechiation in the ear, this is a really bad sign. Something is going on with this pig and we have to do some diagnostics to figure out what. Now, yes, a lot of pig diseases have these same clinical signs. I know that CSF looks like ASF, looks like PERS, looks like any number of bacterial infections that pigs get, um, strep suis. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be looking to see whether or not what we're looking at in these animals isn't ASF and CSF. Conjunctivitis, that's another common clinical sign in pigs. But again, if you see enough of it, you should be thinking, I should send samples to have this tested. So again, what samples should you be thinking? Well, if you look at the old charts for classical swine fever and African swine fever, they were exactly the same. And this is what they listed. 
And again, there's no priority here. No, hey, this is the easiest sample to take, the highest value sample to take, the easiest sample with the highest value that you can get quickly. So in the next generation, they're going to be broken down to things like in live animals, a tonsil scraping or a, a tonsil swab or an oral swab. Those are easy samples with high value. Whole blood, that's an easy sample if you have someone who's straining the animal with high value, but it's not as easy to take by yourself. So if you're by yourself, then maybe the tonsil swab or the tonsil scraping are the better sample. In deceased animals, we've told you which tissues to take, and you'll see there are differences between what lymph nodes are, are recommended for CSF and ASF animals. So this is the type of, of drill down that we're going to hopefully have for you in the next SAD prep manual, which will help make your job just a little bit easier. But I should pause here and tell you that at this point in time, if you have any questions about what samples you should be sending, please do not hesitate to call FADL. We'd be happy to walk through the process with you and tell you which are the highest value samples for the time that you have to take them. Again, this is the, uh, the one of the versions of the new ASF chart, which talks about whole blood. Whole blood is a good sample. Um, tonsil scraping and tonsil swab, we're looking into that for ASF. We think those are good samples. What it lists right here is what's currently approved for both FADL and the Nolan labs to use. So if you send duplicate sets of samples to the Nolan lab, they're going to be able to test this for ASF because they're allowed to use whole blood as a sample type. And there, again, if you want to be using the purple top, which is the sample for PCR. So in a CSF infection, you get a lot of damage to the tonsil, and that's because the tonsil, the epithelium in the tonsil, the, the skin covering the crypts is where the virus grows. You get less damage to a tonsil with ASF, but you still have viral growth there because the tonsil macrophages are where the virus first sets up shop and it starts growing there. So if you cut out a tonsil and it looks like this, it's probably a pretty healthy pig. Necrosis, um, you know, if you had severe damage to the tissue on the surface, that would be an indication that it could be CSF. If there was a lot of hemorrhaging, that could be an example that there's ASF there. Spleen, a spleen is a good sample. Again, it's one of these lymph tissues that has um, a filtration function for the blood. So the macrophages, the infected macrophages from an ASF sick pig go here and they're filtered here and they, they collect here. So it becomes a real high dense virus sample would be the spleen. CSF, it's the same way. Again, you have, once it, the animal goes viremic, it's in the blood for several weeks. So you can find it in the spleen because that virus is going through there and it's being deposited. Lymph nodes, again, lymph nodes, draining lymph nodes could be a really good sample, but you should look at the guidance on which are the lymph nodes that work better for CSF versus the lymph nodes that work better for ASF. How much sample to send? Well, if you think of the bottom of your coffee cup, you want a piece that's, you know, a, a little bit smaller than um, the side to side of your coffee cup, and it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to occupy that whole space. It, it can be a, a, a sliver of that. This spleen sample is a little bit bigger than maybe three or four wooden matchsticks put together. It's about a gram of tissue. And what are we going to do once you've taken those perfect samples? Well, when you get them to the Nolan lab, they're going to do a PCR. When you get them to Fallow, we're going to do a PCR. The PCR for ASF is very sensitive and very specific, and it really is a great test, and it takes about two hours. In two hours, either the Nolan lab or FADL could tell you, yep, it's not ASF. The Nolan lab is closer than FADL. So there are, are especially if you're you know, west of the Mississippi, if you've got a Nolan lab that you've got a close relationship with, if you're taking two sets of samples, they can get you an answer in a couple of hours, whereas FADL is going to take at least a day for that package to get to us. So it really is important to make sure that you have that relationship with the Nolan lab. Virus isolation is not routinely done for ASF unless we see something 
that's cross-reacting on the PCR. And that's because it takes 21 days and requires you to use swine macrophages. Um, during the COVID uh, crisis back in March, we were forced to get rid of our, our donor pigs. We have them again now, but for a, a brief period of time, we didn't even have the ability to do the virus isolation because we didn't have the um, uh, animal care personnel who could have come to the island to work with the pigs. From the virus isolation, again, you can use a PCR and a hemagglutination test, which allow us to say whether or not ASF virus is there. CSF is very similar. Um, it's two to three days in virus isolation, you let it grow. It doesn't cause cell death. Unlike the vesicular diseases, which cause cell death, CSF does not do that. It grows very happily in the SK6 cells. You would never know that they were infected until you look with a monoclonal antibody. So we have to stain those cells at the end of three days or run a PCR. But again, the PCR for this disease is very sensitive and very specific. And in about two hours, it can let us know with really good assurity that there's no classical swine fever in that animal. We can also do staining, direct staining. We do um, um, cryo sectioning of the tonsil, spleen, and lymph nodes, and we can stain for ASF using a monoclonal or for CSF using a different monoclonal. And serology, again, for ASF, there's an ELISA. Um, we've recently validated the immunoperoxidase test, which is the confirmatory test, so we have that in FADL now, and we feel comfortable using it. For CSF, again, it starts with an ELISA. Um, animals that have, pigs that have been exposed to BVD will come up borderline positive on an ELISA, which requires you to do an immunoperoxidase test to show that, nope, nope, it's not CSF, it's really against BVD. Um, the immunoperoxidase occasionally will come up borderline positive. When we see that, we do a, a, a VN test. The VN test gives us a difference in titer between antibodies that are cross-reacting with CSF versus antibodies that are cross-reacting with BVD or border disease. And what you see in these cases is the, the titer for, you know, against CSF will be, oh yeah, it's positive at one to 20. But the BVD will be positive at a one to 1200. So there's a, a, a big difference. Those, if the animal has a high enough titer to BVD, it will still cross-react a little on this test, but you'll be able to tell because the VN will distinguish between them. So my next, please don't do this with a sample slide. Um, we get on a regular basis single tubes of serum or EDTA blood and are asked to test it. Periodically I have to contact the submitter and say, hi, that popped open in transit. These tubes are not specifically designed for transport in a plane at 30,000 feet with no pressure. So if you put this in a FedEx box and the FedEx flies it out to us in New York, there's always a chance that that cap can work its way out. The pressure differential can be enough to allow that to happen. And once that happens, all of the serum or all of the EDTA blood is lost into the packaging material. So we don't have a sample to test. If you take one piece of tape and put it over the top of that tube from one side to the other to hold that cap in place, that's more than sufficient to allow that sample to come to us intact. Brief discussion on priority. A priority one is something that looks like it might be a foreign animal disease because it's in a lot of animals or because there's been movement of animals onto this premise from someplace else or somebody has returned from visiting people in Europe, or any number of things can contribute to the priority of a case. But having all that information from the farmer allows you as the, the practitioner in the field to inform your AVIC and inform your state vet so they can make the most appropriate decision. If they think that there's a possibility this could really be a farm animal disease, they're gonna make it a priority one. Slightly different are our priority A's. Um, these, for the longest time, had to deal with animals in commerce. They would shut down a slaughter plant until if they had a pig with a, a vesicular lesion, 
the slaughter plant would be closed until such time as they knew that it wasn't put in mouth. Now, since we have so much Seneca virus A right now, those rules have all changed, and now they're asking you to hold that animal or hold that product, and we'll do the testing, and then you can't release that product until everything comes back negative. And again, this is one of those situations where having a Nolan lab who can do the PCR locally gets you an answer quickly and allows movement of animals or movement of animal products relatively quickly. So those are priority A's. Um, other known potential circumstances surrounding the investigation might in, indicate that it's really kind of important for you to get an answer quickly. And those are priority twos. And, and we get a, most of our cases these days are priority twos. We get them, we try to pick those up from the um, uh, FedEx facility. We have a courier that goes. Uh, we get those boxes into the lab as quickly as possible and start processing them. And that way, within a day or two, you can start to get answers to uh, what is going on with those animals. But truthfully, the fear in a priority two is not, I'm sorry, this, I'm still on priority A's. We occasionally get weird cases of priority A's that have nothing to do with animals in transit, but are more one-offs. Um, we had a case one time where a pig was released in downtown Boston for no apparent reason. It didn't look healthy. So if somebody drops off a sick pig in downtown Boston, they wanted to make sure that it wasn't sick with a foreign animal disease. So we got those samples as a priority A. Priority two is these are the cases that we get most of the time. Um, it's possible that this is a foreign animal disease, but really, it's more likely to be something domestic, and you really don't think it's going to be a, an FAD. It's going to be something endemic. So we get those cases, and we try to get those done as quickly as possible. And priority three, those are ones where you are in the middle of um, a, a season where, you know, ORF is prevalent in your sheep, and you've had it on this particular farm three times in the past two months. So you're out there again looking at new animals that have lesions and it looks just like the ORF you did last month. That can come to us as a priority three and we'll do the testing and show that it's not foot and mouth and that, yep, it is ORF. FedEx. I used to have a FedEx form here that would show you an example of the uh, how to fill it out to send us samples. And the reason I've deliberately left this blank is because nothing is ever easy. The examples that we have for you currently in the fat prep manual don't apply anymore because nowadays electronic submission through FedEx is more common. Many, many states have moved to the point where you're not using paper anymore. You're going into an app and you're printing out uh, a, a receipt that tells you, yep, this is the tracking number for this package and yep, I paid the bill and everything is all set. Most of the programs released to most of the FedEx facilities across the United States will only take one address. So if you go into your FAD print manual, you'll see that there's part of our address that says, you know, ship to USDA, FAD at USDA.gov, you know, at the top, priority, priority to um, FAD at USDA, APHIS, and then an address. And the address that used to be in that next line would be the Calverton address for FedEx. Now, the Calverton address for FedEx is fine as long as there's no address below that. But the address below that was uh, our warehouse because all of those packages eventually wind up in our warehouse. So our warehouse street address was put there to make it easy for FedEx to know where that box was going. But with the new system, if you can only choose one address, you want to make sure that you're still addressing it to us, that it's still going to FATL USDA, but that it's actually being sent to the Calverton address because that FedEx address is going to get it to the FedEx facility where we have a refrigerator, where they're familiar with our procedures, where they know when we're going to be sending a courier, and they're going to make sure that all of our boxes get to us. The closest FedEx as the crow flies is not the one in Calverton. That's about 40 minutes from Plum Island as the crow flies. The closest one is four miles across the Sound in Connecticut. But if you address things to only the warehouse address, 
they'll go to the FedEx in Connecticut, which will have no way of getting those packages to us. So instead, they redirect those to the Calverton address the following day, and they get to Calverton, and then they get to us. So if you ever have any questions about how you should ship or what boxes you should check, please do not hesitate to call. If you're shipping us samples on a Friday, you want to make sure that you're checking that Saturday delivery box over here in Section 6. Saturday delivery, if you put the Calverton address down, make sure that it actually makes it all the way to Calverton where they'll put it in the refrigerator and that it's not sitting over the weekend in Indianapolis or in Memphis at an unrefrigerated temperature. So if you have questions, give us a call. And this slide just has a whole bunch of contact information. We still encourage you to call the, the 631-323-3256 number. Um, if there's no one there, if you don't get somebody to respond to you, if it's after hours, please call the 631-375-5314. Right now, three of us who are acting as the DSS section head, one of us will be carrying that phone around and we'll answer it whenever it's called. Um, the contact numbers over here for Ames are also listed and those are as accurate as I know. They have recently renamed some of their departments, but the phone numbers that are there should still function for that division. That fab.submissions at usda.gov, that's the email address where if you're sending us samples to FADL, you want to send an email to that with a digital copy of the 10-4, the FedEx tracking number, and the priority of the case. Don't use that email address for samples you're sending to Ames. They won't get it. Unless I know that it's supposed to be going to a specific division in Ames, then I'll forward it to them. But for the most part, each of those divisions in Ames has their own email address that you can find out that you can send their emails to. And my last slide is just uh, please pay attention to what's in your package. Many, many years ago when I first started with APHIS, we had a, a veterinarian who went out to a, a cattle farm and they did some sampling of cows. And one of the things in the box was a sock with what looks like blood on it. And we didn't know if this was cattle blood or human blood. If it's cattle blood, fine, we can autoclave it and throw it out. If it's human blood, we've now contaminated the work surface and we have to have safety come in and decon everything because of human pathogen. So everything sat in the hood for about five hours while we figured out what this was. Turns out that it was actually shoe polish. This sock had been used to polish different shoes with different shoe polishes and then was thrown out in a plastic bag. They just didn't realize when they grabbed a plastic bag to put samples in that they'd grab the same plastic bag. So pay attention to what's in your box. Make sure that you're sending us the things you need to be sending us in the condition you need to be sending them. And I'll take any questions if anybody has any. Okay. Well, we do have a lot of questions in the chat. Um, do we want to give directions on how to ask a verbal question in case anyone wants to do that? Sure. As we move to Q&A, please press pound 2 on your telephone keypad to enter the question queue. You will hear a notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, please then state your name and your question. Once again, dialing pound 2 will indicate that you wish to ask a question. So let's start out with our first question in the chat. Um, if we need to euthanize a larger species for sample collection as regulatory animal health officials, what is the protocol? And do we need to be in contact with a local veterinarian who can use euthanasia, euthanasia solution as we're not allowed to use this as USDA vets? So there are several issues. Um, if you have to euthanize it, first off, you want to make sure that you Cross your T's and dotted all your I's. We do not pay for those animals. If you're part of a depopulation effort for something like uh, the Newcastle disease outbreak, things are slightly different because those people are getting paid for those animals. If you're involved in an FADI and you have an animal that's not doing well and you ask the owner, hey, can I put this down, make sure they understand that you're not authorizing payments for that animal because 
believe me, after the fact, they're going to come to you and say, no, that was my, that was my milk cow. Well, you, you shouldn't have killed that animal. So you want to make sure that you're having a conversation with the state vet and with the AVIC, and they're going to help you through this process because under most circumstances, they're going to tell you that it's safer not to put that animal down because you could be held responsible for it. So from that perspective, if you had to do it, make sure that everybody understands exactly what's involved up front and that no one's expecting something. Now, in terms of the euthanasia, I was not a, I didn't know that in your particular state, you were not allowed to use um, Fatal Plus. But yeah, if you have to contact somebody to get that material sent to you so that they can put the animal down, that's something you have to do. So the next question is, what is the typical shelf life of BHI and TBTB media? I believe that NVSL certifies their tubes for at least 12 months. It might be two years. But um, if you look on the – periodically, when we had the uh, high-path avian influenza outbreak in 2015, they actually were releasing emails that say, if you are holding on to media that's got an expiration date of, you know, March of this year, it's been extended till March of next year. So they, ha they have certain flexibility with how long that's good for. So if, you're, if your dates are coming up, contact them to see if you can get new. They may tell you that, oh, yeah, that particular lot has been extended because right now, Due to COVID, for example, we can't get the people in place to do the work to get you more material at this time. So they may have, have things like that going on. So it would be a contact the facility in Ames and ask them about the expiration dates and, and if any of them have been extended. Can you provide some perspective on the tests ran at the NOM labs versus battle? Sure. The, the NOM laboratories, for the most part, um, have the PCR testing. A lot of the ELISA tests that we run for, or for antibodies are kits that come from other countries, and for a long time they had select agents as part of the kits, known positives that were, you know, would give you a positive response. So those kits couldn't be released to the NAL lab. I know that there are new kits out there now where we're looking into the possibilities of having some of those kits be approved for use in the NOLAN laboratories. Right now, though, most of the tests that are out there are PCRs. They cannot do amplification tests. So if, if they suspect that this might be FMD, they test that by PCR first to make sure that it's not FMD. If we then do our tests and we confirm that it's not FMD, then they might be allowed to take that sample and put it into the appropriate cell line or egg culture to see whether or not a domestic disease is actually what's going on in those animals. So virus isolation in the large part is not one of those tests that they can do in the NOLAN lab. Is USDA still looking at oral fluids as a sample for ASF? We are looking for oral fluids as a sample for ASF, CSF, and FMD. We're doing those um, tests right now. We have a partnership with the lab in Canada that is supplying us with some of their data as we're doing tests to, um, you know, parallel tests. We're supplying them with our data, and we're trying to come up with guidance for use of oral fluids for all of those foreign animal diseases. Um, a, a lot of progress has been made on that. I know a negative cohort's been done. We're in the middle of the positive cohort studies. Uh, so. The effort is ongoing. It hasn't happened yet, but I don't think it'll be all that much longer before you start to see circumstances where oral fluids will become a test that can be used. Um, most of those are probably going to be related to if we had an outbreak. If we had an outbreak, you'd have rapid approval of those as a sample test for certain circumstances. But again, the rules about how that answer is used would be limited. So uh, we have a lot of confidence that if you get a positive off an oral fluid, that's real. What we're not so sure about is if you get a negative off an oral fluid, does that mean anything? 
So that's where some of that hesitation comes into my, my conversation. We will have very specific rules about how those can be used and when they can be used um, for certain circumstances. So is there any particular kind of tape that works better on blood tubes? No, it really doesn't matter. Any piece of tape, I mean, even scotch tape across the top, all you're doing is that the, the little bit of stickiness you get from the tape is just enough to hold that from wiggling itself out during the pressure change when it's in the box flying to us. So it doesn't take a, a lot. I, I don't recommend using, you know, two rolls of duct tape to tape the lid on. We certainly have had some people who have used, you know, seriously, like 18 inches of black electrical tape <laughs> to tape a top on, and that takes us 20 minutes to cut the damn top off. But <laughs> under normal circumstances, you know, a three-inch piece of scotch tape going from one side of the tube to the other side over the top of the, the, the cap is more than sufficient. And leave a tab. That's my good thing to say, my tip. Leave a tab <laughs> so it's easy to pull it off. Um, yeah, I was, I was, I was going to say that because, you know, <laughs> you're, you're already working hard to get us a sample in the first place. If you don't have time to leave a tab, I'm not worried about it. <laughs> Is it okay to submit a serum sample in a serum separator tube? Absolutely. That wax plug is actually very useful. One of the problems we have with serum, especially in the summertime, is that you'll get hemolysis. And those serum, serum separator tubes, um, some vets will spin those down before they send them to us. That's great because that means, you know, there's no chance that there's going to be hemolysis that affects it. Um, it when we get the samples, those serum separator tubes, if they haven't been spun, we'll spin them. And, again, they're very helpful at, at separating out that clot from the serum, and it, it makes the serum all that less hemolyzed. If you get too much hemolysis, it can become impossible to use the sample for an ELISA test. They're very sensitive to hemolysis. So anything that you can be using like that that can help us make sure that the, any hemolysis that's present is limited would be very helpful. So we do have a comment here. It says many FedEx offices um, won't let you use paper anymore due to COVID. Right. Pretty interesting. And, yeah. And they've gone to that electronic submission, and that's where a lot of people are currently running into the problem of which of the two addresses do I use. And that's why I wanted to make the comment about, you know, the Calverton address. Our Calverton FedEx facility recognizes that a, a large chunk of their boxes that come in every morning are packages that are supposed to be going to Plum Island, whether they're packages for DHS or packages for ARS or cases for FATL. A lot of those boxes are tagged as going to um, our facility in, in Orient Point. So they know where we are. And the fact that you're sending it as a, a diagnostic submission with our, you know, FATAL name on the top of it, they know that those samples go right into the refrigerator that's been purchased for them, and they're kept cold so that the samples don't degrade over time. So we do have a question here, which I think I can answer. It says, whatever happened to the program where all FADs are automatically sent new FAD media in tubes each year? You know, it started and then it was dropped. And you are correct. It was started and then it was dropped. And part of that happened when High Path AI came. Um, and they just could not keep up with them, everything in the warehouse in Ames. The other issue is that if people didn't have, if FADDs didn't have a profile in ERMRS that had their shipping address and they received an email and they didn't get back to NBSL, it became a problem with communication. So they have stopped that, and I don't know that it will come back. Um, my suggestion is that if you, you need to check your tubes because they all have dates on them for expiration. And if you see you're getting close, it's just to call NBSL or you can do it online. So if you have any questions about that, just let me know. Are there any other swab medias other than TBTB okay to use, such as when a company that collects swabs for us in a culture tube? So there are medias that are okay and there are medias that are not okay. And, it, you know, it varies from, from tube to tube and company to company. Some medias, um, there are a whole series of medias out there that are referred to um, as 
virus stabilization medias. So, you know, you can send us a sample and we can do the PCR. The problem is a lot of those actually have a detergent in them. And once you have a detergent in the sample, although it, it may help keep things from happening that would take away from a PCR, it also means I can no longer do virus isolation. So the TBTV and the BHI are real basic solutions that, that, and I don't mean that from a pH perspective, I mean that from it, they're very, they're not very complicated. There's nothing um, priority about them, but they're not going to impact negatively the sample that's in them. One of the, the things that I will tell you, please don't do is, there are any number of swab tubes out there that you can buy from any number of different companies where when you're all done taking the swab, you're sticking into something that looks like a gel. Those gels are very good for bacterial culturing, but they really, really are horrible for samples that you're sending for vesicular um, virus diagnostics. The, the auger itself not only removes the sample and holds it in the auger so you can't get that virus anymore, it's in the auger, but any auger left on the swab when you rinse the swab with media to get off what you can and do the PCR, that auger is inhibitory to the PCR. So again, those types of gel tubes, don't use them because they're going to make using that sample impossible. The next question is for priority two and three submissions to FADL. When the FAD doesn't have any questions, is the email notification sufficient or do you also want to have a phone call? No, the email, the email notification is sufficient. Um, I, I appreciate the phone calls for letting me know. I also find that if you call up to let me know that, that you're sending a box, sometimes you have a question you just didn't call ahead of time, but you'd still like to ask it. And I have no objection to that. If you want to call, go ahead and call. But the truth is the email that goes out goes to the entire diagnostic services group so everybody who does diagnostics knows now that your box is coming, that these are the samples. The people who do PCR know that, oh, hey, I'm getting swab samples tomorrow to do vesicular PCRs on a cow. They know that, you know, the people who do serology can say, hey, I'm getting three serum samples tomorrow that I have to run on the CSF ELISA or the ASF ELISA or both. Um, it, it just helps everybody in diagnostics become prepared that your box is coming. So the, that email really is a very effective communication tool. If you are choosing one, choose the email. Okay. Will expired tubes make the test officially inconclusive? Uh, what an ugly question. Um, <laughs> the, answer, the, the answer is that all depends whose lawyer you're asking. Um, if you're using an expired tube and you send it to me and it's TVTV and the color still looks right, but the expiration date was last week, I'm going to run that test, but I'm gonna put a little note at the end of the report that says, due to the fact that this media was expired, I cannot, it, it goes along the lines of, I cannot guarantee um, negative results as official. So, yeah, it depends who's looking. We have to put that in there because we're ISO accredited. But anybody normal who's going to look at your data is going to say, well, the fact that the FMD was negative, but the parapox was positive as hell, it's going to know that that swab was still good. So I think that, yes, you should be aware that we're going to have to note that that has happened, that two cents of expired media, but it doesn't mean that nobody's going to believe the results. I think no. I think because of the way that we do the investigation, the way that we are trying not only to prove that it's not a foreign animal disease, but that it is something domestic, usually the fact that we've shown that there's a domestic virus present in that swab makes everybody relax and say, okay, everything was okay because we saw this. Now, I can tell you that on occasion, everything's come up negative on the PCRs and I get phone calls. We run a test at FATL. Um, not only do we use Xeno like the, the non labs do to show that our PCRs are performing within the expected ranges, 
but we usually do a, a, um, a test for a housekeeping gene that you find in cells. And that actin PCR tells us that there was really something in that tube. So if you do a swab, I'll get uh, an actin PCR result that will come back in the low to mid-30s, and that will tell me, yep, that swab was actually done correctly and it actually got to us okay. So if you ever had a, a case where you were getting um, questions about how valid were the results based on the fact that you would used an expired tube, we could look at the actin results and tell you whether or not there was anything in that sample. Okay, we do have a couple more um, written questions. I just want to check to see if there were any verbal questions in the queue. We do have a caller here in the queue. Would you like to go ahead and take that question? Let's go ahead and take that question. Caller, your line is unmuted. Please go ahead and state your name and question. Hi, this is Sharmila Dasgupta calling from the New Jersey Department of Agriculture. My question is that if we separate out the serum, put it in plastic tubes, uh, you know those little uh, 2 ml um, or 5 ml little like plastic, the clear plastic, yeah. the clear plastic tubes, and then cover it with parafilm, okay. the cap, is that okay to send? Yeah, as long as you're making sure that the, um, the, the snap cap tube or whatever you're using to send us the serum um, is sealed, we're good. So it, it, much like the, the blood tube with the rubber stopper, those tubes can pop open in transit. So, yeah, if you separated out the serum for us, I thank you, because that, that makes it less likely that there's hemolysis and more likely that we're going to get a sample that we can use immediately. Okay. The only thing I would say is just make sure that you're treating the, the cap the same way. If, you, if you're sending it to us in a snap cap tube, just put a piece of tape over the top to hold the, the cap in. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And we did have another question that was along those same lines, so I think a written question, so I think we're okay there. Um, can you put small pieces of tissue from vesicular lesions in the same tube as nasal swab or coronary band swab? Yes, so any time that you have a lesion that you're swabbing, if there are tissue tags that are easily taken, if you have um, a cow that's got little tissue tags along a, a lesion on its coronary band and you pull those tissues off, chances are good it's not going to notice because they're relatively small pieces. I'm not talking, you know, half an inch. I'm talking those little tissue tags. That becomes sort of an enhanced swab. By dropping that into the same swab that you, you – you know, the media that you use for the swab itself, any virus that's in that tissue will come out into the media and be processed in the media and we'll be able to get, you know, it'll basically, if there's virus there, there'll be more virus because you've added those tissue tags. I highly recommend doing that if you can. So this especially is a question in the summertime, well, I just wanted to finish. So in the summertime, um, especially if you're in a VSV state, those tissue tags on the tongue, VSV very often causes severe damage to the tongue epithelium, and it, it, it almost sloughs off. I mean, you can reach in and, you know, with a finger and, and get tissue on your finger. You put that in the same swab tube. That's fine. Sorry, please. Go ahead. So does the bad investigation manual have examples of FedEx labels with correct addresses for different delivery days? I think I can answer that by saying, yes, they are in there, but it's based on the priority. That's how those labels are put in there, and they're based, some of them are for AIMS and some of them are for FADL. So this is all being updated because I don't know, I don't know that they're accurate right now if you can't use a, um, a paper form. Right, and, and I think I have five or six different paper forms filled out different ways depending on the priority and what day of the week it is that you're sending it. So if you really want them, send me an email, and I will be happy to send you the ones I have. If a producer or their veterinarian provides USDA with swabs of vesicular lesions and viral transport media, would you like us to transfer anything to TBTP media tubes, or should we keep it in the viral transport media? I would just keep it in the viral transport media that they've used because um, we'll be able to look up from the company whether those 
contain a detergent or anything else that might negatively affect virus isolation, it, it'll allow us to at least have all the information up front. It does you no good after the fact to move it from one media to another. Okay, we have two more written questions in the chat, and then I think we're going to have to call it a day because we're still past our time. When submitting a sample collected via swab, is there a preference of breaking the swab and leaving it in versus not to? I'm going to tell you the same thing I tell every fab school <laughs> I've ever had this conversation with. You have to do what's easiest for you. Um, with, the, with the Dacron or polyester swabs, the material you've collected on that swab comes off very easily in the media. So if it is your preference to put the swab in the media, swirl it around a couple of times, and then pull it out and throw it out, fine. If it's easier for you to snap it off and leave it in, that's fine too. It does not matter to us. If you've taken the swabs out, I would just put down on the 10-4 form that you've removed the swabs. Sometimes we get extra tubes in the box and they'll look like they were swabs that were never used. If you've actually used them, make sure to let us know that, no, this really was a swab sample. But it, whatever's easiest for you when you're doing the investigation. We are supposed to be helping you, not making your life harder. Can expired DHI or TBTB media be disposed of in a sink and washed down with water or tube with media placed in a regular trash? That's a good question. Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't yeah. see why not. They're, they're, they're a salt solution. So yeah. if you're asking me what I would do with leftover TBTB, i pour it down the drain. If you're asking me from a regulatory, you work at a university and you don't know what their rules are for disposal of trash, I can't help you. I know that when I was, <laughs> when I was a graduate student, we had very strict rules about what could and could not be put into the trash, but that was based on the fact that that trash was all being taken to a public landfill for disposal and people would go and sort through the garbage to see what was in there, and if they found a tube of media, they might call their representative and say, they're throwing infectious material into our local trash. So it's a perception thing. So there may be rules about, you know, dumping the whole filled tube into your garbage, but that's something that you'd have to take up with your local people. Um, there's a question here about timeline for providing on-site fab training at battle. Um, that is up in the air right now, and until the COVID situation becomes a little bit better, I don't see that happening. Um, our first course in 2021 is scheduled for the very beginning of February. I certainly hope it's going to happen, but um, we'll let everyone know. And the other question or statement says, Saddle FedEx label in the manual shows the Orient Point Warehouse and the Calverton address. Which is correct, if right, you want to hold it at Calverton, yeah. Are there any other verbal Let's... questions? There are currently no questions here in the queue. And Greg, do you have one more comment? No, I just wanted to thank everybody for, for tuning in today. I know a lot of you have heard this uh, before. It, it, I cannot say enough nice things about, you know, the the workforce that's out there working with the animals and doing this job. You guys are spectacular. You don't get hurt getting samples. Make sure that you're being safe. Well, with that, I want to thank Greg for doing this presentation. I do have him scheduled for another one um, on August 6th about classical swine fever. I'm going to send out that connection information uh, a little bit later today. And with that, I will say have a great afternoon. That All right, be safe, everyone. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.